chosen IEEE SB of Raghu Engineering College and the APS student chapter for launching the RAW S phase array antenna tools. The student chapter members are very close to you and many of them are great followers. I take this opportunity to request you to mentor the team towards good projects on this tool, sir. I heard that uh, Ms. Riya served as intern and you mentored her to take a major portion during the development of this tool. So I really appreciate her for her commitment. It's really fun working with you at the same time, building strength not only as an engineer, but also as a character while students working with you. Oh, browser, you, you will find uh, such students in Raghu group. And both colleges are doing pretty good in establishing uh, IEEE student chapters with good number of student volunteers. So on behalf of Raghu Engineering College, I welcome all for this international online workshop on phase array and reflector antenna design and analysis tools. Raghu Engineering College, which was established in 2001, 22 years back, now it has an intake of around 2000 VTEC and around 72 MTech students. So Raghu, our chairman Raghu sir, is very much interested in organizing such a workshops online and offline. That is how we could encourage students as well as faculty members to participate in various events that is one such international online workshop. We were given an opportunity by Dr. Sudhar Rao, Sudhakar Rao Garu, President CEO Rao Consultants, LLC USA. Thank you, sir. I also welcome Dr. Gaurangi Gupta and Ms. Ria Kota for this international online workshop. So I request Harshini, Sai Harshini, Chair APS Student Chapter, to introduce the guest. Thank you, sir. A jubilant evening to one and all. On behalf of IEEE student branches of Raghu Institute of Technology and Raghu Engineering College, I wanted to say that it's our privilege to organize this international workshop. We are excited to bring together the experts and researchers in the field of phased array and reflector antenna design. In the interest of time and to ensure we make the most of this valuable session, I will provide a concise introduction of our esteemed speaker today. Though there is an abundance of noteworthy achievements and a rich bio to delve into, I will highlight just a few key points to give you a glimpse of his impressive background. Dr. Sudhakar Rao is the president and CEO of Rao S Consultants LLC, providing technical consultants to several companies over the past 47 years of his professional career. He worked at Northrop Grumman Space Systems, Lockheed Martin Boeing Satellite Systems, SPAR Aerospace Lit Montreal, University of Manitoba, University of Trondheim, Norway, LRDE Bangalore, IIT Madras, and ECIL Hyderabad. He developed and successfully implemented antenna payloads for 90 different satellites and 10 aircraft, vehicular, and ground communication programs. Dr. Rao is an IEEE Life Fellow, a Fellow of IETE, and a Life Fellow of WAMS. He received several awards from IEEE, Boeing's, Lockheed Martin's IEEE Region 6 Outstanding Engineering Award for 2017 and the 2017 Northrop Grumman's President Award. He received Distinguished Alumni Professional Achievement Award from his alma mater, NIT Warangal, in 2016. Dr. Rao served as the IEEE APS DL and ADCOM member. He was the founder and chair for the IEEE APS Industry Initiatives Committee, served as IEEE APS Fellow Evaluation Committee member. He is the founding executive committee member of the WAMS series of conferences in India. He instituted IETE Dr. Sudhakar Rao Award in 2020 to recognize and honor outstanding antenna engineers. Now, let's make the most of our time with our distinguished speaker. I request Dr. Rao to deliver his lecture. Thanks, uh, Sai Harshani, for your introduction and also chairing the IEEE SPC. Uh, of uh, Raghu Institute of Technology, not only chairing, but also making it vibrant and uh, uh, with many activities in the recent past. Also, like to thank Professor Choudhury and Professor Samir Chakravarti for their initiative uh, for this workshop. Uh, recently, I know that uh, you guys have formed the IEEE APS chapter in Vizag Bay section a few months ago, and uh, hope that. Uh, will conduct many activities like this through either IEEE APS chapter or IEEE student branch chapter. 
As most of you know, Raghu Institute uh, is organizing VAMS 2024 in Vizag during February, March 2024. So you're all requested to contribute uh, papers and also attend the symposium. And I'm sure that uh, you'll be well taken care of uh, by the organizing committee. Uh, face the, uh, Shriya, can you open? So phase the rays and reflector antennas are very widely used uh, uh, either in satellites or uh, radar systems or aircrafts or ground communication systems. And uh, most of the engineers, uh, even experienced engineers and uh, most of the academicians uh, use only brute force methods uh, in designing these antennas uh, without, uh, without much insight into the fundamentals. So as a result, I think you get uh, non-optimal values in the design and also it takes a lot of time to designing these systems whereas uh, so in this workshop and uh, uh, the motivation for this work is to develop a software for quick analysis and uh, design uh, of uh, phase arrays and reflector antennas uh, so let me uh, next page share So this is the agenda. I'll go through the I'll go through the team, uh, the motivation behind it, and then the antenna theory will be uh, briefed by Gaurangi Gupta, and then phase array software and reflector antenna software details will be briefed by Shia, and then we can talk about the future work, and then the, I want to leave about 15 minutes or so at the end for questions and answers. So be uh, anything I think you want to know, I think you can ask the questions and we're here to try to answer them. So on the right, I think there's some pictures I, I'm showing. One is advanced AHF satellite uh, on the top left. So you can see that when it's in the deployed view where solar panels are deployed and the spacecraft is uh, in geostationary orbit, so you see actually 16 antennas on those, maybe you can't see most of them, but out of that, there are three are phase arrays and about 12 are reflector antennas. So there's one TTNC bicon antenna and one global horn antenna. So you can see that uh, most of the payloads either use reflectors or phase arrays. And I was talking to some of the engineers at Raman um, so how long it took to design the phase array? So they said it took like uh, almost two years because it's uh, they, they have been using HFSS software and it's uh, it's not a design software. It's uh, basically iterative uh, analysis. That's how you do the design. And every iteration takes so long. So that's not useful when you're doing the proposal because you're not given much time. So you have to give uh, quick answers. Uh, uh, probably within a week or so. So that, that's the idea behind uh, developing this software. I think uh, you will see more details later. On the bottom is a phase array for advanced CHF, uh, especially receive and now with anti-jamming capability. So it has about 400 elements. You can see the heat pipes where it uh, dissipates the heat and dumps into the radiator panel. So it's down converted to C-band from 45 gigahertz. That's where uh, uh, beamforming is done and then it's done converted to digital and all the processing is done digitally. Uh, on the right you see the uh, uh, missile, the new missile system which uh, uh, Northrop is developing and I was part of the uh, design of antenna systems for that. And on the bottom you can see a deep space network. Uh, uh, this is about 64 meters I believe. Um, so mainly to communicate with all the satellites. So I think we use a, a, a Gaussian beam analysis. I'll explain a bit later on the Gaussian beam analysis, how it's being used. So next one, Shia. Yeah. So this is my team. So Gaurangi Gupta is an antenna engineer at NASA JPL. She works on the weekends part-time uh, and also she mentors uh, Shia. Uh, so 
ನಾನು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ ಇಸ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೊತ್ತ ಶೀ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಇಯರ್ ಶಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಇಯರ್ ಬಿ ಎಸ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ ಸೊ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಶಿ ಫಿನಿಶ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಇಯರ್ ವರ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಟ್ ಪ್ರೆಸ್ಟನ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಇನ್ ನ್ಯೂ ಜರ್ಸಿ ಸೊ ಶಿ ಜಾಯ್ನ್ ಎಸ್ ಎನ್ ಇಂಟರ್ನೆಟ್ ವೆನ್ ಶಿ ವಾಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಹೈ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ವೆರ್ ಮೋ ಶಿ ಡಿಡ್ ಮೋಸ್ ಟು ದ ವರ್ಕ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಕ್ವಿಕ್ ಲರ್ನರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಫಾರ್ಟಿ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೈ ಕೆರಿಯರ್ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಎಂಡ್ ಸೇ ಇನ್ ಎನಿ ಇಂಟರ್ನ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಸೋ ಕೇಪಬಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೋ ಟ್ಯಾಲೆಂಟೆಡ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಅ ರಾ ಟ್ಯಾಲೆಂಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಶಿ ಇಲ್ ಬಿ ಬಿಗ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಶ್ಯೂರ್ ಸೊ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಕರೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ವರ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರಾಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ವಿತ್ ಕಂಪನೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ಇ ಎಸ್ ಕೆನಡ ಯೂರೋಪ್ ಎಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಸೋನ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಎಂಡ್ ಡನ್ ಎನಿ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಬಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಸೋನ್ ಸೊ ಮೈನ್ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಆಫ್ ಫಾರ್ಮಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕನ್ಸಲ್ಟೆನ್ಸಿ ವೆನ್ ಐ ರಿಟೈರ್ಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ನಾರ್ತ್ ಆಫ್ ಗ್ರಾಮಲ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಇಯರ್ ವಾಸ್ ಮೈನ್ಲಿ ಟು ಮೆಂಟರ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕಾಲೇಜಸ್ ಇನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ವೆರ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಲಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ಯಾಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಲಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಟ್ಯಾಲೆಂಟ್ ಎಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಸಪೋರ್ಟ್ ಕಾನ್ಫರೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ವ್ಯಾಮ್ಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸೆಟ್ರಾ ಸೊ ಫೋಕಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಆನ್ ಇಂಡಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಕನ್ಸಲ್ಟೇಷನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟ್ರೈನಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯಂಗ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಷನಲ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹೋಪ್ ಟು ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ದಮ್ ಟು ಬಿಕಮ್ ಎ ಗುಡ್ ಇಂಜಿನಿಯರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಫ್ಯೂಚರ್ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಮಂತ್ so if you look at the conventional phased arrays uh, typically designed using hfss everybody uses i think whether it's good or not uh, they uh, blindly use uh, not just uh, uh, starters but also even senior engineers i think in industries problem is it takes too long uh, i explained you because it's not a design software it's uh, design is through iterative analysis and it's not suitable for quick design and also not accurate because most of the time it uses flow chem mode analysis which is uh, valid for uh, infinite arrays so finite array effects are not properly taken into account and it doesn't take into account the grading loops so if you are an engineer if you don't know how to uh, keep the grading loops away from the coverage i think it doesn't give you any guidelines uh, scan loss is not accounted properly and the loss due to pointing error etc is uh, difficult to compute unless you go through several iterations so basically it's a brute force method without insight into the design principles so that that's where i think uh, the motivation came so go to the next one so our approach is based on fundamental design principles and engineering approach so it employs gaussian beam analysis so uh, if you want to read more about gaussian beam analysis i think we wrote a paper uh, in 1988 uh, almost like uh, how many 30 almost uh, 30 34 35 years back when i was in canada working for spar aerospace so that's uh, uh, the motivation came because uh, they want to use the radiation uh, templates to describe the shaped beam uh, uh patterns on the ground so that they can use for interference analysis so so for that i think we used gaussian beam analysis and compared that with uh, uh, several measured patterns like brazil site and enki nxd i think four or five uh, satellite programs and uh, uh, results were very uh, uh, accurate not only just uh, to estimate the minimum coverage uh, uh directivity over the uh, uh, over the shaped beam and also the radiation outside the coverage because that's where interference is going to come uh, going into neighboring countries or uh, neighboring regions so that needs to be uh, accounted properly but at the same time you want to have a simple formulas because uh, the operators are uh, want to use it uh, quickly so that's where we developed and it became international standard now adopted by CCIR and ITU. Uh, then I think in uh, 2002, we did a parametric design and analysis of uh, multi -beam, multiple beam reflectors. Uh, so that's published in uh, AP Magazine in uh, 2002. Uh, that gives the basic uh, principles uh, how to design the reflector antennas and uh, etc. Uh, and the bottom reference I think is more recent, 2020. so you can uh, that's also published in IEEE uh, antennas and propagation magazine uh, uh, 
that, that's uh, published with uh, another intern, uh, Colin Astrod. He is now working for Amazon in uh, Seattle. So why Gaussian beam analysis? Because uh, that's pretty uh, easy. I think you can get most of the uh, radiation uh, uh, pattern definition, at least on the main beam, very accurately. And what you need to know is basically what is the 3D beam emit. Once you know that, then you can express the main beam using ocean beam analysis. Uh, and the design includes grading lobes for a given scan region. So I think we give you some uh, guidelines how to uh, put the grading lobes, uh, where to put the grading lobes outside the scan region, of course. Uh, provide choice of different uh, element types. I think uh, based on the element type, we sort of uh, give you guidelines uh, uh, for the efficiency. And it can handle different grids and the different aperture shapes, for example, uh, uh, a square grid or hexagonal grid, uh, circular aperture or square aperture or in between hex aperture. And scan loss calculated more uh, accurately. Uh, so it will be useful once uh, you, uh, for a given coverage, if you want to uh, estimate the worst case uh, gain over the coverage, I think you need to include the scan loss. So that's, uh, uh, that's important. And then the array design parameters are obtained about uh, size, the spacing, et cetera, for a given requirements like directivity, et cetera. And then the patterns are also obtained. Uh, patterns will be envelope patterns. Uh, it's not exact uh, patterns, but it gives an envelope of a main beam, then the near inside lobes and far outside lobes. So good thing is it takes less than a minute. I think uh, initially, I think it was developed uh, uh, in uh, MATLAB, and then uh, they wanted, uh, we sort of also included Python versions. So both are available. Okay, next one, Shia. So formulation is simple. First, you have to given the requirements like directivity, scan region, etc. cetera. Uh, you calculate the inter-element spacing based on the maximum scan angle, wavelength, and the wavelength has to be at the highest frequency. Uh, and then the array lattice and the grading lobe uh, location. So based on that, you determine the inter-element spacing. So once the spacing is known, then uh, you know how much area is uh, uh, for, the, for each element based on the grid. And then you can calculate the element gain based on the type of element you use. Type of element you use is uh, it depends on the bandwidth and other requirements, polarization, etc. So as an engineer, you have to decide what element uh, to use. Maybe a, a horn antenna for um, uh, satellites with uh, three lambda or so size. For uh, large scan, I think it has to be something like very small element like uh, uh, slots or patches or something different, uh, especially for radar type applications. Then you choose the num uh, get the number of elements and array size based on the directivity requirements because you already have the element element gain. So only thing is you need to know what is the array directivity needed, uh, uh, and then based on that you can determine the number of elements. Then you calculate the half power beam width based on d over lambda and the what taper you need on the array. So the elimination taper on the array is dictated by the side lobes. So most of the cases you want to keep uh, uniform illumination taper, but uh, in some cases you have to reduce the side lobes, for example, radars and uh, satellites on uplink, uh, where you need to adapt the patterns, your side lobes have to be very low, so you have to put the taper. So here we give you an efficient taper, which is a parabolic taper that maximizes the uh, uh, efficiency for a given uh, taper compared to other types of taper. Uh, then you determine the scan loss uh, based on the coverage area and the 3 dB beam width. We give the uh, equations for that. And then you calculate the worst, worst case directivity and the gain uh, over the worst case of the scan region, not just the both side gain. Right? And then the patterns are computed over three regions. Like I said, the main lobe region, which is basically false as a Gaussian beam. And then it uh, cuts off at uh, whatever is the uh, side lobe level, peak side lobe level. And then first a uh, few ne uh, near inside lobes are constant, and then you have uh, 20 log uh, uh, decay for the far outside lobes. 
So that that's how it's uh, determined. Next one. What happened there, Shia? Got cut off? Okay. So these are phased arrays. I think what you see is a phased array on the left side for advanced EHF uplink antenna that works at 45 gigahertz. So that has to be very low side lobes and it's the coverage is small, plus minus nine degrees roughly. So I think for that, I think we have to keep the grading lobes because you want to reduce the number of elements. So the element size here is about three wavelengths uh, because you put the grading lobes uh, uh, around 12 degrees or so. So if not, I think your uh, number of elements grow exponentially. If you go, for example, one lambda, it goes like 10 times. More number of elements you need instead of 400, you need 4,000, so which is very expensive. So that's not needed actually. So that's why you have to look into grading lobes uh, very carefully. I think you want the grading lobes, but you want the grading lobes outside the coverage region. And then uh, the grading lobes are plotted in the middle with the red plot. In the wave number plane Kx and Ku, it tells you where the grading lobes are and it's, it's a good representation and uh, it gives an insight into your design as well. In some examples of, uh, uh, phased arrays uh, on the right side, you see bowtie uh, element used for uh, uh, phased array at uh, 60 gigahertz. And on the right side, you see some rigid uh, guide elements. And the uh, bottom right, you see a conical uh, notch element uh, used. So there are different types of elements. So you have to know what to apply. And uh, depending on the ba uh, bandwidth and polarization, you have to decide on the element type. And all these phase there is heat dissipation is a key factor. So idea here is to improve the efficiency of the SSPAs and uh, minimize the losses, uh, front end losses uh, to keep the dissipation low. And any dissipation, I think heat generated, especially transmit arrays, you have to dump them, even receive arrays, you have to dump them through heat pipes uh, to radiate the panels. Okay, next one. So these are some vehicle antennas I think we sort of developed recently at Northrop Grumman. This is a new uh, missile uh, system which uh, US is planning with many, many, they want to replace the Minute, Minute Man 3, which is old uh, uh, missile systems. Uh, uh, so with the new system, it's almost a $100 billion program. So antenna is the key element. Because before I think the phase variation requirement uh, that basically decides the antenna how critical the antenna design is. Used to be about 25 degrees peak to peak. Now with the advanced uh, uh, systems, uh, they reduce to less than two degrees and we put the antenna spec as 1.2 degrees peak to peak and we achieved it. Uh, so it has uh, three bands, L1, L2, which is GPS bands. And then there is also S band, which is a telemetry and command uh, uh, frequency band. And uh, it's a novel design. I don't want to say too much about it, but uh, it's a continuous uh, number of elements because that's how you reduce the phase variation. Any finite number of elements will increase the phase variation. Um, so, and then between that, I think uh, to improve the isolation, we have our fences. You can see on the right side bottom. So there are basically three rings, uh, one for L1, another for L2, and the other for S band. And these are fed uh, uh, sectorially. I think they're fed with, uh, you can see on the bottom side. And everything is very thin because you cannot have very thick uh, uh, because it's a heat shield. I think uh, you basically cut the heat shield a bit and then uh, 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 incorporate the arrays and then put the heat shield back. Um, so that's how it is done. So next one. So this is also another one uh, we did a couple of years back to replace all the uh, ground stations which uh, Air Force, uh, uh, US Air Force is uh, responsible. There are hundreds of them. So different sizes, uh, 13 meters to up to 2.5 meters to communicate with the different um, satellites, uh, uh, mainly at uh, 
current thing is basically at L band and uh, uh, L and S band and K band, three bands. So now they want to expand because there are so many satellites came up with uh, new frequency bands. They want to include the seven more frequency bands and they want to use the same infrastructure. So what we did is we use the same main reflector and backup structure, but we cut the struts, we cut the feed, we cut the K band horn on the left hand side and then replace with the simple uh, multi uh, nested coaxial uh, feeds uh, with its own sub reflector. So feed cone is actually holding the sub reflector and uh, you can support seven additional frequency bands going up to upper K band and uh, some HF band as well. So it always it covers from L band to HF band. So I think it's uh, we delivered, I think, three systems. I think uh, now they want to replace all other systems with this uh, uh, new and capable system. And the advantage with this is we get one, one dB more gain uh, compared to existing design at uh, conventional bands of L, S, and Ka, because we don't have the struts and we, have, we don't have the blockage, and we have the frequent, we don't have the frequency selective uh, uh, surface to separate the two frequency bands, low and high bands. Uh, okay, next one. I think probably that's uh, that's all I have. And this one is basically to tell that there is a significant gap uh, in academic training versus uh, real world engineering. So the question is, are the universities providing proper training to future engineers? This is not uh, just in uh, one country. I, I think it's global. In US side, I also see same problem. Everybody teaches uh, microstrip patches, and uh, uh, that's fine. I think you can, uh, but uh, uh, you also need to teach what exactly the real, real world uh, antennas looks like. So, software-wise, I think uh, people know most of the university have, universities have HFS, CST, FICO, but they don't have. They don't know what. Uh, I mean, if you don't have, that's fine. But most of them, they don't know what is the grasp software which is uh, highly used for reflector uh, designs. Machine software, Champ, Cobra, Savant is for aircrafts uh, uh, to do co-site analysis, Path 3D to do the multi-faction analysis. So all these are real world software that's needed. And in terms of hardware, I think uh, typically people use patches, slots, and reflector rays. And in reality, you can't use uh, most of them, at least for space because of uh, ESD and other uh, impacts. So real world, you use horns, reflectors, and uh, 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 for uh, phase arrays, et cetera. Um, so this thing actually in US, I think it's a big problem. So the defense wants to bring up the universities and uh, small industries to the level uh, where they can handle the big uh, contracts. So this is called MPP, uh, uh, Mentor Prodigy Program. So Northrop Grumman in this case is a mentor and uh, 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 then uh, Prodigy is uh, custom microwaving and then uh, university is, uh, uh, we have uh, Cal State uh, University, uh, the professor on the left side uh, uh, next to me. Uh, and his, uh, uh, they give like two students to work with the company. Uh, so they basically every day they come and work with us and uh, uh, go to the uh, subcontractor, which is CMI in this case, and work with them as well and learn. And after their term is done, then we employ them. So that's a deal. I think it went for three years. I think it was highly successful. So they gave another uh, three year extension of this contract. So it's continuing now. So. Hopefully something like this will uh, really help uh, in India uh, as well. So university uh, company and then uh, government supporting this. So the basic message is don't work in isolation. So you need network and uh, collaboration as well to sort of uh, see what's exactly outside the universities uh, uh, by working with industries. Okay. I think that's all I have. So. Next one, I think, is uh, Gaurangi, I believe. She gives some basics uh, on the antenna theory. And then we go to Shia uh, on uh, software details. 
Yeah, yes, sir. Oh, hello, Prabhan. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Yeah, uh, just before starting your session, uh, let me ask Harshini to introduce you to the audience. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, ahead. Dr. Rao, for your authentic lecture. Now let me introduce our next speaker, Gaurangi, ma'am. Dr. Gaurangi Gupta is an antenna engineer at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, California Institute of Technology, USA. She is currently working on the antenna development for radio telescope and satellite communication applications. She completed her master's and PhD in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, Kanpur. India in 2014 and 2020 respectively. During her PhD, she worked on the design and development of low profile antennas with meta surface reflectors. She worked as a research associate at IIT Kanpur during 2020 to 2021, where she worked on phased array antennas for satellite on the move application under an industry collaborated project. Under the Indo-US Fellowship during 2018 to 2019, she worked as a visiting scholar at the Remote Sensing Center, University of Alabama, where she contributed to the ongoing radar development. She has published multiple papers in journals and conferences and is a recipient of Best Paper Awards and Travel Grants in IEEE conferences. Now I request Gaurangi Ma'am to deliver her lecture. Um, thank you so much. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma sure. So uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so uh, my uh, small contribution to this session will just be on antenna basics. It's it's uh, it's like uh, really focused towards students and it will help you give uh, a basic on what we are trying to achieve in the code and what are the trade-offs involved in the initial design of the phased arrays and the reflector antennas. Uh, so I'd start with the very basic Fritz transmission equation, which basically determines how much power we will receive at the receiver, uh, depending on how much power has been transmitted uh, from the transmitter end. So uh, we can see here that the received power is dependent on, of course, the transmitter power. Uh, then R, R is the distance between the receiver and transmitter. Uh, DT and DR are the respective directivities of the transmitter and receiver. Then ECD is your uh, efficiency on each end. Uh, then gamma are the input reflection coefficients at both transmitter and receiver. And the, the dot product of the row is basically the polarization loss that we encounter in between. So we can see that in order to enhance the received power at uh, the receiver end, one option is to increase the uh, power on the transmitter end. But when we are working in the satellite uh, kind of uh, in environments, it's very difficult because we are working on a very limited power budget. So the other option is to basically try to enhance the efficiencies and the directivities of our antennas. So when we talk about directivity or the gain of antennas, it's, it's basically uh, in comparison with an isotropic antenna. So when you have an isotropic radiator, it basically means that it will radiate in all the directions. But when we want to establish a link between the transmitter and receiver, we want this antenna to radiate uh, highly in one particular direction and suppress the radiation in all other directions. And directivity is basically the measure of that. And when you try to include the efficiencies uh, in terms of uh, whatever the conductor, uh, lo conductor and dielectric losses are there, uh, whatever mismatch losses are there, whatever polarization losses are there, then it uh, gives you the uh, the real number as to uh, how much directionality uh, and uh, power we'll be able to transmit to, towards the uh, receiver direction. So, uh, so this is irrelevant here, but I just wanted to give you an example of how the older uh, cell phone antennas had just one isotropic or omnidirectional kind of radiator, which would uh, gave us coverage uh, irrespective of whichever direction uh, we would be in. We, so the basic job was to uh, establish a communication with one of the cell phone tower, 
but as we move forward we want to we want to have like higher uh, data rates and we are moving towards 5g technology and all so so instead of having those uh, one radiator we are now having multiple radiators which are uh, either phased arrays or they are slot arrays in nature and they help us uh, so within the same footprint of the antenna they help us gain uh, higher uh, higher data rates which was otherwise not possible so similar is the case with uh, satellite telecom similar is the case a case with uh, ground uh communication uh, so the basics remain the same but our job is basically to enhance uh, how much we can get out of the limited resources that we have uh, another factor which i wanted to bring in here was the effective antenna aperture so uh, directivity so so basic concept is that there is a fourier transform relationship between how the current distribution on a surface is versus what would be the Uh, the beam pattern or the radiation in the uh, in the Fourier domain. So basically, it what I'm trying to say here is uh, when you see this relationship in in this block here, it basically says that the effective aperture of our antenna and the directivity are directly related. So, for example, if you want to increase the directivity of any antenna, uh, the 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 first and the basic thing that we need to do is to increase the net uh, aperture of the antenna but when we talk about this aperture it's not just the physical aperture of the antenna it's basically amongst uh, the entire physical area that you have uh, what is the uh, like what is that um, uh, what is that effective aperture out of that which is responsible for the radiation and which is a very important concept in antennas which is the aperture efficiency so our job at most times uh, as antenna engineers is to enhance the aperture efficiency of the antenna so uh, just wanted to show you uh, the variety of antenna elements that we have and uh, the different jobs so you you would have seen uh, basic dipole antennas and pfa antennas in your courses uh, but but these are the very uh, uh, these are the the most basic kind of antennas Uh, when we want to increase the frequency bandwidth of this we try to go towards frequency independent antennas like sinus antenna lock periodic antennas when we want to increase the uh, radi uh, the, the 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 radiation or or the directivity in any particular direction we want to go towards higher uh, gain antennas which are uh, usually uh, vivaldi antennas and horn antennas and uh, patch antennas also you you must have seen so patch antennas are Uh, are the, uh, the the planar versions of this which have benefits of their own especially when we are able to design uh, patch antennas using all metal self supported uh, structures so uh, why i'm trying to show these to you are that these are the uh, the basic components uh, which form uh, the antenna elements for uh, both the phased array antennas and also the feeds for the reflector antennas and uh, and they have their uh, uh, particular benefits so for example if we want to design um, uh, if we want to design very high efficiency reflector antennas and we have the bandwidth for that we would probably want to go towards horn antennas because they are highly efficient and they have uh, they have established uh, uh, multiple benefits especially in, in terms of using them in the spaced applications versus when we want to have uh, phased antennas with a uh, higher scan range then we we'll probably want to go with smaller elements uh, like dipoles and uh, half wavelength half wavelength patches because in that case we would want to have lesser scan loss and these are the uh, antennas which provide us like wide beam uh, radiation patterns which are which are good uh, in those scenarios so the the key take away from this is depending on the uh, application that we have depending upon the element footprint that uh, we have from the trade studies based on that we choose the uh, the kind of antenna element uh, that would be the most fitted in a situation like that so talking about phased arrays uh, phased arrays of course we want when we want higher gains we want higher directivity is out of that but also we want to have uh, 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 
basically we want to have uh, these beam widths uh, which we can control so so the way to control these so for example when you see uh, the phase array over here uh, if you see in the x direction uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the basically the the feet uh, for this antenna or or the uh, yeah the feet for this antenna has been fixed so we cannot uh, play much in the x direction but when we are in the y direction when we are looking at the sub arrays in the uh, towards the y direction each of these have been fed by their in, uh, by their independent control circuitry and by virtue of this we can have uh, the beam patterns uh, in the way we want so for example if we want to scan the beam versus we want to create nulls in any particular direction or we want to enhance the gain in any particular direction then by a combination of this we can uh, we can get uh, those beams so for that uh, in any phased array uh, of course we feed them using uh, power amplifiers on the transmit side and we use lnas on the receiving side but the major contribution for these uh, reconfigurable beams is by using attenuators so these attenuators could be amplitude attenuators attenuators or phase shifters so how just by shifting the uh, phase of these uh, individual components how we are able to get uh, the beam in the desired direction is just by the simple fourier transform property so for example uh, we know that uh, the current on uh, on this aperture distribution and the direction cosine uh in the in the radiation space they are uh, interconnected by the fourier transform pair so uh, whenever you have any uh, linear phase change in the current distribution in the space plane what it would mean uh, in terms of fourier transform is it would go and reflect as the change in the uh, in the uh, radiation pattern in the theta domain theta domain basically means the radiation domain so this means that just by changing the phase, the relative phase between uh, the current elements we can change the uh, direction of our beam in the theta domain or in the radiation domain another thing uh, that i wanted to highlight here was uh, was this uh, basically the equation of directivity what you can see here uh, the second term here is basically uh, n it's dependent on n and n means the number of radiating elements that we have and the third term here is basically uh, your direct relationship between uh, the the effective aperture and the directivity so we can say that this term here is basically the directivity of your individual elements and we can just apply uh, the multiplication factor of n and and being the number of uh, elements that we are using and we can enhance the directivity uh, uh, just by the multiplication factor or in the logarithmic terms every two times uh, so every time we double the number of elements we can enhance the directivity by 3 db and that's how by using multiple of these uh, radiating elements forming an array we can enhance the directivity of the entire aperture uh, now talking about uh, so I, as i was saying that there is a fourier transform relationship between the current distribution and the radiation pattern so if we assume that we have a a 1d uniform current array so if if our array is uniformly excited uh, so we can say that let's say the overall length of the array is l so this l is basically a combination of multiple uh, multiple antenna elements or in the simplest form maybe combination of multiple hertz dipole so how that translates how this pulse function here it translates into radiation domain is basically your sing function so by 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 the by this relationship we can see here that the nulls are dependent as a function of in uh, inverse of l so basically what it means is when you increase this length how you can increase this length you can increase this length by increasing the number of elements or we can increase it by increasing the distance between each of these elements so by changing this l we can change the location of our nulls or in other words we can change the beam width of this uh, beam so we know that the beam width and directionality of the beam are directly 
proportional to each other. So when we increase L, we can basically enhance the directionality of this antenna or the directivity of this antenna. But as you see that for sync function, we always know that the first side lobe will have 20, 21 percent of the energy. The second side lobe will have 13 percent of the energy. So this is something we cannot control. So if we have any specific uh, current distribution, so these side lobes, the, the location of the side lobes we can change, but the, uh, the level of the side lobes we cannot change. So what it means is in the bigger picture that uh, we can, uh, by changing the number of elements or by changing the spacing between the elements, uh, we can change uh, the directivity of uh, this and where the nulls and the side lobes are located. But uh, the overall uh, distribution of the power that will be heavily dependent on the kind of aperture that we use. So now it takes us to the comparison between rectangular and circular aperture. So rectangular aperture is basically the 2D case of, of just uh, what we saw. So it's basically a multiplication of two sync functions in the X direction and in the Y direction. So here, uh, it, it, what it basically means is that the side lobe will be 13 dB down versus when we have a circular aperture, uh, the circular aperture Fourier transform would be Bessel's function of first kind, where we will instantly get uh, lower side lobes of 17 dB. So when we compare these two apertures, circular aperture can also be like considered very similar to how a hexagonal aperture would be. So we can instantly see that we can get lower side lobe levels uh, using circular aperture. So it has its own benefits, specifically when we are uh, uh, when we want to radiate in any particular direction and we do not want to have uh, side lobes which might be interfering with other uh, uh, maybe which may be interfering with other receivers or we want to uh, we want to maximize the energy that goes into our main lobe then in that case there is an option to choose between the kind of aperture that we have and in most satellite uh, applications we prefer circular aperture for this reason but on the other hand, the scan loss, as you'll see in the description of the code as well, the scan losses will be lower for rectangular aperture. So if we want to have wider uh, scan region for our beams, then uh, probably we want to prefer to have rectangular aperture like that. Uh, so as we saw that by just varying the phase distribution, we could change the direction in which we radiated, but we could not change the side lobe levels. So for that, we already saw that the keys that we have in our hand are one, we can change the phase, the relative phase between these current elements or, or basically between these antenna elements. The other knob that we have to twist is basically uh, having an attenuator or having the, um, the amplitude uh, distribution as a function of uh, the surface. So here, uh, when you see uh, these four graphs, they'll tell you the importance of this amplitude distribution or the tapering. So when we had this uniform distribution here, it resulted in a particular pattern uh, of how the radiation happens versus we can taper uh, uh, how the current distribution happens over the surface. So for example, if you have higher current amplitude in the center elements versus lower current amplitude in the outside elements, maybe something which looks like this, using that, you can reduce the side lobes. So basically, we know that this entire radiation pattern is a summation of the, uh, is the summation of the radiation patterns of all of these, right? So we can uh, forcefully keep uh, the radiation part, uh, forcefully keep the current distribution such that it has higher amplitudes in the central elements versus lower amplitudes in the outside elements. And that way we can control how the side lobe levels would look like. So as Sir also mentioned, uh, parabolic distribution is the most efficient. Uh, why it is most efficient is that you can see here that if we wanted to change uh, the phase distribution and the amplitude distribution at every stage. So if each of uh, them were a different number, we would have to design as many number of amplifiers uh, for each stage. So what that would mean is that the design cost of each of these would be really high. 
versus if we have let's say finite number of steps let's say three steps or four steps uh, of these amplification numbers which can give us the desired uh, radiation pattern in that case our cost will reduce significantly and it will also be efficient overall so there are other kind of distributions also that uh, we can choose from like chebyshev gaussian butterworth distribution but uh, again uh, the the question boils down to what's the efficiency of this overall system versus the cost versus the design time so uh, that's where the parabolic distribution usually wins so yeah as i was saying that we can increase the antenna directivity or the directionality by uh, two ways one we can directly increase the number of elements which would reflect in the uh, in the product that we were seeing uh, the, the basically the function of n the other option is to increase the element size or the or the net aperture area for each of these elements so uh so it, it it should have been easy right it should have been obvious but then the uh the grating lobes start to come into picture so when we have elements which are placed farther than half wavelength so you can see here that the blue curve is basically when your elements are placed at half wavelength the green curve is where your elements are placed at 0.7 wavelengths so you can see here that uh by having uh like wider spaced elements uh the green curve the beam width is basically reduced or or in other words our uh, directivity has enhanced the side lobe levels have lowered but uh, you can see the grating lobe appearing here so what is this grating lobe this grating lobe is just very similar to uh, what happens in the aliasing in the spectrum when we have under sample uh, signals so here also we can imagine that since uh, we are working in the fourier domain Uh, which is basically radiation pattern being the fourier transform of the current distribution so the sampling theorem also applies here and when we have under sampled uh, signals or basically when we have lesser number of uh, elements in the spaced array which are far apart then it leads to aliasing in the spatial domain and we get a grating lobe so grating lobe is something that we cannot avoid especially when we want to have uh when we want to have very high uh, uh when we want to have very high directivity uh, patterns but the the uh, the basic design uh, trade here is we want to keep this grating lobe out of our radiation region so for example here if we wanted to uh, if we wanted this beam to scan between let's say minus 20 degrees to uh, to plus plus 20 degrees in that case if our grating lobe is outside this region we will still be okay with it but we we have to design it in such a way such that we we do not uh, basically keep our uh, uh, keep our elements too far apart so that this grating lobe starts coming into our, our actual radiation range and it starts to interfere with the uh, with the actual signal so uh, just in nutshell uh for for phased array performance as you'll see in in the code that shreya has developed also uh the basic design uh, parameters that we have the performance parameters we have is directivity then the scan range and whatever losses that come into picture and what we have what the knobs that we have uh, at our disposal are element uh, type size and spacing then the number of elements that we have the kind of aperture that we want to choose and the kind of current distribution or the tapering that we want to choose and uh, by using a combination of these uh, we could get a quick design and an optimal design very quickly by using this code once we have uh, a good design uh, that satisfies all the requirement uh, it's then when we should take these to full wave simulations and uh, look at the actual performance for these so just wanted to quickly touch on the on the reflector antennas so reflector antennas again uh, what we are effectively doing by having reflector antenna is we are trying to increase the uh, the effective aperture area here uh, so as compared to any feed antenna so ex example if it was only this feed antenna which was radiating in in this direction uh, the the aperture size of this antenna would have been very small 
uh, against that, what we have done here is we have put a, uh, a parabolic or any shaped reflector as a matter of fact. And by using just the ray optics like, like we use in light, uh, we have increased the aperture area of, of this entire system. And uh, when we look in the far field, this will be basically a plane wave, uh, which has a very high directionality as compared to the original antenna. So when we are designing reflector antennas, again, there are a lot of trade-offs to be taken into consideration. For example, do we want to keep a center feed kind of configuration versus do we want to have an offset feed kind of configuration? We can directly see here that uh, when we have center feed, it will be more symmetric in nature. So the side lobes might be lower. Uh, but uh, when these reflected uh, waves uh, come back, this feed will itself act as a uh, like a blockage. So it will reduce the, the effective area that uh, which which will be used for uh, the radiation. So as compared to that, when we have an offset feed where we have a clear ends uh, in the in the direction of radiation, then we can avoid this feed blockage completely. The other configurations that are widely used are uh, by using sub reflectors like Cassegrain and Gregorian, and uh, having sub reflectors basically means that we can uh, the 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 best uh, uh benefit of this here is that we can keep our feet uh, towards the reflector. So what it reduces is uh, one, we do not have to deploy the feed. Uh, so and and the circuitry involved. So whatever the cables and uh, whatever amplifiers and everything are there, they can be so the feed can be kept very close to that. And we can maintain the uh, the 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 phase uh, linearity and other things which otherwise start and like uh, keep uh, distorting the performance. We can keep them in control. The secondary reflector then what uh, how it helps in the second way is it reduces the um, uh, it reduces the, the the expectation from this feed. So we just have to illuminate this reflector properly. Then the reflector, the secondary reflector would do its job. It will reflect the final uh, large reflector and uh, we can still get the better performance. So here, what we have done is instead of uh, putting all the performance requirement on the feet, now the performance requirements have to be met by using this combination of feet and secondary reflector. So when I say the performance requirement, what it means is one, uh, you can see here that uh, you want to illuminate this reflector as uniformly as you as as possible. So that is what is called as the aperture tape for efficiency. So as we also saw just just now that if we have uh, in the case of phased arrays, we also saw this that if we have uniform distribution, then we get the highest uh, efficiencies out of that. Versus when we have tapered distribution, uh, we can reduce the side lobe levels, but uh, the efficiency also goes down. Uh, similar is the case here. So if we want if we want to have like the highest gains or highest possible directivity out of this reflector, we would want to radiate it as uniformly as we can. So that is what is called as the taper efficiency. Now, the next one is the spillover efficiency. The spillover efficiency basically means that we, we want most of the energy from this feed to radiate just this reflector and not outside this reflector. So whatever it ref whatever it radiates outside it outside the reflector, what it will do is one, it will reduce the efficiency, and secondly, it it may go and uh, radiate other. Uh, there there may there may be a ground plane below this, right? There may be ground surface. There may be other circuitry of the spacecraft that we don't want to illuminate. So it can go and illuminate those and then create a distortion in the patterns or it can create the, the loss in the efficiency. We do not want to do that. So, so the spillover efficiency becomes really important. So if you notice here, the choice of the feed that we have, it is heavily dependent on the size of the reflector that we have, the shape of the reflector that we have, which in turn defines how the taper efficiency and the spillover efficiency will look like. So, so the the slide that we uh, saw about the the type of feed antennas that we have, uh, how we choose from that is heavily dependent on what are the requirements here in terms of the 
this the size f by d ratio of the reflector and also the 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 efficiencies associated with the feed uh, when we talk about the surface rms error uh, when you notice um, on the right side there is uh, this is basically a mesh reflector and uh, it's it's not a solid uh, reflector even if it was a solid reflector uh, then also by the way it is constructed uh, so ideally we would want a surface that is very close as possible to let's say a parabolic surface but uh, when we build reflectors like this so you can see here that uh, these are the ribs that are supporting the structure and then there is a mesh uh, which is held between these uh, ribs so what happens is that in this case uh, your uh, so the, the the net surface that we have it has slight distortions from how our ideal parabolic reflector would look like and these distortions basically form the basis of the surface rms error so it it can uh, one it can be due to manufacturing or secondly it can be due to the environment that we are operating in for example if we want to deploy this in, in space then how well the deployment happens uh then secondly when you have uh, so so how many number of ribs for example in this case you want to have in order to uh in order to get a surface uh, uh like that has least amount of surface area then third you can see that this is a mesh reflector so uh, how well uh like how close your mesh should be that it gives you minimal uh Uh, so 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 we can see that if there is a mesh instead of a solid reflector some of the energy will get reflected some of the energy will pass through but we know that if this mesh is the holes are very small as compared to the wavelength then uh, the amount of energy that is lost uh, due to that would we'll be able to reduce it to a really a small number so when we are taking into account uh, the reflector shape and the the root mean squares uh root mean square errors associated with that then it has a lot to do with how we are able to manufacture it how well we are able to shape it how well we are able to deploy it so uh, uh it can also change as a function of temperature so for example if we operate it on moon uh the uh the temperatures are very high during the day and temperatures are really low during the night so as this uh, as a structure like that is uh, exposed to such temperatures then uh, with time or or with temperature uh, the the surface can uh, the surface can basically get distorted so all these numbers they contribute to the surface rms efficiency so when we take all these things into account uh, so the the directivity requirement we have here it's it's basically not just a function of the frequency and the aperture size that we have it is also a function of uh, this efficiency so let's say if you require a gain of uh, 20 db then you will have to add all these uh, efficiency losses to that and that basically forms the uh, requirement on your directivity so uh, when when we were uh, writing this code so we have taken all these things into consideration and shriya will walk you through how how uh, we go from the design sorry the design requirements that been uh, that have been given to us to go to an optimal design and also we give a range of uh, other possible designs uh, that uh, that the user can choose from uh, depending on the uh, requirements so this was all from my side thank you so much for giving me some time yes yeah, thank you thank you very much madam yeah harshini yes sir uh, thank you gaurangi uh, ma'am uh, for your extraordinary lecture now let me introduce our next speaker mishriya mishriya is a second year undergraduate student at princeton university in the electrical and computer engineering department She is involved with a variety of student organizations on campus, including Engineers with Borders and Nacho, the South Asian Dance Company. Shreya is a great dancer, choreographer, mentor for school kids in maths and science, and volunteer for Green Earth, multi-talented girl with great attitude. 
She has been an intern at Rao as consultants for over a year and has worked on developing programs for quick analysis of phased array antennas and reflector antennas. Seeing your online session in PDU, uh, we were inspired and eager to hear from you. Um, uh, I request Ms. Shriya to uh, deliver her lecture. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and thank you for having me. I'll go ahead and share. Um, are you able to see the screen? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, we are able to see. OK, um, yeah, thank you. So I'll go ahead and present um, the programs that we have developed um, for the design and analysis of phase theory antennas and reflector antennas. So a quick introduction to um, the program. As we discussed, initial antenna design using full wave simulations can be very time consuming. So we have developed this program to allow um, using the equations in literature to allow for a quick and efficient way to um, get the design parameters and the analysis material for um, phased array and reflector antennas. Um, this presentation um, highlights the methods used and the equations um, used to develop this program, and it could be useful for students, researchers, or engineering professionals. This tool should be the starting point um, for further optimization and detailed evaluation um, for the designs of the antenna. Um, so the first part, um, I'll go ahead and go over the phased array antenna. Um, the software presented has been developed in both um, MATLAB and Python. So um, there are three main components to the program. First is the um, First is the user interface of the phased array antenna. Um, it requires the user to enter um, the required data, which includes the frequency, the maximum scan angle, the desired maximum array gain, um, the element efficiency, and the illumination taper. And then along with these um, required inputs, the next section of inputs are optional, and they can be incorporated um, based on the user's preferences. And these values are all the losses for the antenna. So it includes the illumination taper loss, the antenna loss, pointing error loss, loss over beam diameter, and the implementation margin. Um, next, the um, program presents several data um, tables to, um, to highlight the input parameters of the um, antenna and the design parameters that are based off of them. So the equations used, um, again, I'll go over in this presentation, and they form the basis of the phased array antenna design. After the design information, the program provides users with radiation patterns and several analysis graphs. The radiation patterns provide information about the side lobe levels and their locations. And then the analysis graphs vary the parameters around the optimal values so that we can better understand the additional design possibilities and um, further optimization methods for the antenna. Anyway. Um, this is an image of the user interface um, that we designed. Um, like mentioned, the first set of inputs so the frequency, um, maximum scan angle and degrees, the gain in DBI, element efficiency, um, and the edge illumination taper are the required inputs. And then um, the next set of inputs are all the losses and they're optional. Um, the picture shown um, in the middle, um, the big one is the one that we've designed in MATLAB. And then the one on the top right is um, a similar um, user interface, but that one was developed in Python. So for um, the sake of this presentation, we use the design example and assume that the frequency is 30 gigahertz, 20 degree scan angle, 30 dBi gain, 90% element efficiency, and um, zero dB illumination taper. Um, just for um, this example, all the losses are kept at zero, and a Potter horn is chosen as the radiating element. So 
So the array requirements are specified in terms of the um, required gain and the maximum scan angle over um, of the desired coverage region that we just um, inputted before. So based off of those, the directivity is calculated, um, taking into account the directivity at the bore site. Um, lambda is the wavelength at the lowest frequency and 0 0.9 is a typical efficiency value that we use. Um, then the half power beam width is also calculated at the bore site direction and at the scan edge as shown in the equations in the middle. They take into account D and the maximum scan angle. Lastly, um, the grading lobe location is calculated. The grading lobes can be presented outside the scan angle um, region for telecom antenna arrays and at 90 degrees off bore site angles for the radar antenna arrays. The multiplication factor um, between 1 and 1.5 ensures that the grading lobe is outside the scan region. So in this case, in the equation, we used 1.5, but um, anywhere between 1 and 1.5 um, ensures that it is outside the um, scan region. Once these values, um, so the grading lobe, the directivity, and the half power beam width, once they have been defined, we can develop the array lattice configurations. Yeah, I, I think the grading lobes have to be calculated at the highest frequency because that's the worst mm -hmm. case. And the directivity has to be calculated at the lowest frequency because that's the worst case, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this table outlines the grading lobes as per the directive. Um, as per the different scan coverage regions and the directivity requirements. So like mentioned, the chosen grading lobe um, locations are approximately 1 to 1.5 beam widths away from the maximum scan angle to avoid um, interference with the main beam. In um, this example, we used 1.5 beam widths. Um, so because our design example requires a 20 degree scan angle and uh, a 30 dBi gain, the um, grading lobe location is approximately 28.8 degrees. And um, yeah, like we mentioned, um, the, the directivity is governed by wavelength at the lowest frequency, um, while grading lobes governed by the highest frequency. So as the bandwidth of the antenna increases, it becomes difficult to achieve the required directivity at the lowest frequency while avoiding grading lobes at highest frequency. Why is that? If you calculate the directivity at the lowest frequency and the grading lobes at the highest frequency, then you can achieve both uh, over the band, right? It depends mm -hmm. on how you, how you input your uh, parameters yeah so i, I think, think that's we, what... we have some guidelines right how to yeah yeah okay um this next table is um the first table that's provided um to the user and it just shows the user's requirements based on the entered data so it displays the wavelength, the maximum scan angle, um, the assumed grading lobe locations, the maximum gain, um, the required directivity, and the array efficiency. And it shows the directivity at both the bore site and the um, scan angle. So once the information has been um, calculated, we can go ahead and figure out the lattice configurations. And they're based on um, two parameters, the element spacing and the number of elements. So the element spacing um, with the equations in the left um, are directly related to the maximum scan angle and the grading lobe location. So the maximum scan angle is defined as theta SM, and then the grading lobe locations are defined as theta G. And it varies for the square and hexagon um, lattice as shown above. The square lattice is shown on the left, and the hexagon lattice is shown in the middle. The number of el um, elements is calculated based on the element directivity and the peak directivity. The achievable element directivity is based on the 
is um, the achievable element directivity is based on um, the element spacing that we just calculated and the element efficiency. And the peak directivity takes into account the gain and um, the losses, including the scan loss. So the equations for element directivity um, is the one on the bottom. And then this is the peak directivity, the one in the middle. And using both of those, we can calculate the number of elements. In this example, the square lattice um, with 81 elements has a spacing of 1.21 lambda and shown um, in this grid and the hexagonal lattice with 91 elements and a spacing of 1.4 lambda is shown um, in the grid in the middle. These lattice configurations assume that the element is designed to um, consume the entire area calculated for spacing. However, these requirements, um, based on the requirements, the element size can be chosen to be smaller than um, the calculated value for spacing. So the chosen um, lattice, um, either the square or the hexagon lattice, depends on the array requirements and the intended purpose of an array um, of an antenna. The square lattice is used to minimize the scan loss for applications requiring large coverage regions, while the hexagonal lattice reduces the number of elements required for an antenna with small um, with smaller scan angles. For the 20 degree scan angle, um, the square and hexagon spacing is um, as shown 1.21 lambda and 1.44 lambda respectively. Which is dependent on the element spacing. So therefore the scan loss for the square and the hexagonal lattices should be calculated individually because they will differ slightly. For an array of directive elements, the scan, um, the spacing with more than one wavelength, the scan loss is given on the left, um, where the constant A represents the type of radiating element, and then um, DE is the element diameter. Um, using this value, we can go ahead and calculate the scan loss using the equation on the top, which takes into account um, theta 3 and the maximum scan angle. The scan loss for arrays with spacing less than one wavelength like patch or dipole antennas, um, we can use the equation on the right. Um, the constant N here is typically between one and 1.5. So the scan loss for the square lattice is 1.44 dB and is 1.92 dB. In this case is not much. Um, and it becomes more significant in wider scan regions. Thus, um, like we said before, for larger scan angles, we prefer a square lattice to reduce the scan loss. And for smaller scan regions, we would prefer the hexagonal lattice. So this is the second um, table that's presented to the user, and it provides the necessary antenna design parameters. Um, it shows the element spacing, the element directivity, um, the number of elements, the peak directivity at the bore site, and the directivity at um, the scan region. And then it provides the half power beam width and the grading globe locations at the bore site and the scan angle. In this scenario, we would prefer the hexagonal lattice because the number of elements is lower to reach the required directivity. As shown, um, we need about 67 elements for the square lattice and only 64 are needed for the hexagonal lattice. So once the design data is, um, is calculated, we can go ahead and um, display the radiation patterns. We look into the aperture distribution of the current on the array um, as displayed in the code. Um, it is well known that the radiation patterns for a uniform current distribution um, on a rectangular aperture can be represented as the sync function, um, like mentioned before. And in this case, the equation for the sync function is shown on the top um, with 20 log 10 sync um, of 
nx, which is the number of elements in the x direction. Um, and then theta shown here is the elevation angle. The, um, the graphs that use the sinc function are the ones on the top that say the square aperture. And then for the circular aperture, it's the graphs on the bottom and the equation on the bottom. And it uses the Fourier transformation, um, the Fourier transformation of the uniform current distribution, um, in this case is the Bessel's function and the radiation pattern um, patterns are shown. So the radiation patterns have been um, plotted for both lattices, um, the square and the hexagonal lattice using both the square aperture and the circular aperture. The patterns have been scaled to the peak directivity of 31.48 dBi as we calculated in the design example um, for the square lattice and then about 32 dBi um, for the hexagon lattice um, based on the calculated directivity. Um, as we see here, the circular aperture results in lower side lobe levels as compared to the rectangular aperture. And um, yeah, so this is this is the main information that we can see from these patterns. Um, next we have um, next we have several analysis graphs that have been um, that have been created by varying the parameters around the optimal values. Um, to understand additional design possibilities and um, optimization methods for the arrays. The graphs show that the directivity, these graphs show the directivity of an antenna um, at the bore site and the 20 degree scan angle with respect to the number of elements. So the number of elements are varied um, in this case between approximately 40 um, and 110. The efficiency and the spacing values are calculated inputs, um, and we these remain constant, and only the number of elements is um, changing in this scenario. So the spacing for the square um, lattice remains constant at 1.21, and the hexagon remains 1.4, while the number of elements vary from 40 to 100. In um, the next set of analysis graphs, we show the element spacing um, that varies um, and the directivity and the grading lobe um, location is calculated based off of the element spacing. So as the directivity, um, as the directivity increases, the, num the element spacing increases. However, the grading lobes approach closer to the boresight direction and that limits the scan range. Um, the scan loss is a function of element spacing and therefore as the spacing increases, the scan loss also increases, limiting the directivity at the edge of the scan coverage region as shown um, by the um, dotted lines which represent the 20 degree scan um, region and then the solid lines represent the boresight direction. There are no grading lobes for plots with spacing less than one wavelength, um, so it's not represented for a small section of this graph. These design curves could be useful for antenna engineers to choose um, the optimal parameters as trade-offs between either number of elements and um, the element spacing. The preference, however, we note should be towards um, minimizing the number of elements as they come with overhead feeding networks, amplifiers, and associated um, other associated loss and losses and costs. In applications with lower side lobe requirements and non-uniform non, non -uniform amplitude distribution is commonly used. It reduces the side lobe levels. However, um, it also lowers the antenna efficiency and broadens the beam. Among the aperture distribution techniques, the parabolic aperture distribution can result in the highest efficiency um, for the given side lobe level and is most commonly used um, as mentioned in the previous presentations. The um, equations, the graph here shows the illumination taper um, and the efficiency plotted against each other. The edge illumination taper is given as 20 log 10 
of t and the antenna efficiency can be calculated using the equation on the top. Um, and the efficiency values for various illumination tapers um, are presented in this graph. So for a 5 dB edge illumination taper, we obtain a frequency of about 27.4, um, oh, sorry, 97.4. Um, and for a 10 dB, um, we, we obtain an efficiency of 91.7%. And lastly, for the phased array antennas, we also um, display the normalized gain patterns. These graphs show um, the patterns for t equals 0, 5, 10, and 20. Um, for these graphs, the 3 dB beam width and the side load levels are calculated using these equations on the right. So the bottom shows um, the 3 dB beam width, and then the side load levels is the equation um, below that. And then using those, um, those two values, we can then um, form the gain pattern using the three equations on the top. So the first um, equation is the, or the first um, region, which is in blue in the graphs, is defined by the first equation um, on the right. And this is the main beam region up to the first side lobe. The second region, which is in orange, is um, the near inside lobes. And the third region is the far outside lobes, which is represented in green. And these three are the equations that we use in order to find um, those, um, those functions. Shreya, sure, I think on the side lobe level on the bottom, on the right, I think there's a mm -hmm. T missing, I think. 0.376 times T. Oh, yes. Right. Yeah, there should be a T. Let me see. Yeah, okay. I think. Yeah. I think yeah. 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 Um, so this is the program for the phased array um, antenna. So it has the input table, the output table, um, and then it presents the radiation patterns and um, the analysis graphs along with the illumination tapered graph. And then these four normalized gain patterns um, are displayed um, in the code. Um, and the graphs and the tables that were presented here are the ones that um, the code produces. So I'll go ahead and um, quickly go over the reflector antenna as well. So the reflector antenna also uses the design equations and the guidelines that um, are presented in literature. And I'll go ahead and go over the equations that we use. Um, it also has the user interface with the required inputs. And then it provides users with the configurations and the design um, data variables. Again, there are some analysis graphs that have um, been plotted to understand um, varying the um, parameters around the optimal area in order to um, just understand different design possibilities. And then um, there, we also plan to incorporate um, other future work, including um, incorporating the radiation patterns and additional parameters for um, a more accurate result, um, similar to what we did with the phase array antenna program. So here's the user interface um, for this program, and this is the MATLAB version. It asks the user for the required inputs, which are the reflector diameter, the reflector FID, the offset, the frequency, um, the illumination taper, and the scan angle. If the offset clearance requirement is not met, the program will display no clearance, and um, it won't go ahead and move on with the program. Um, so the clearance height must be met in order to get accurate results. In this design example, we used um, a diameter of two meters, F by D is one, and the reflector offset is three meters, um, frequency is 12 gigahertz, illumination taper is 10 dB, and the scan angle is five degrees. So these are the um, equations for the design of the reflector antenna. Um, using the provided input, the program calculates the focal length in meters along with the corresponding wavelength values for the focal length, the diameter, and the clearance height. So focal length is um, defined as F, the diameter is D, and H is the clearance height. Um, and these values are better displayed on the visual on the right. So this is the diameter, um, this is the height, and then the horizontal values, the focal length. 
The equations for the design geometry are also shown in the middle. So the values for theta star, theta zero, theta one, and theta two are also shown in the visual. Theta star is the feed tilt angle, speed tilt angle from the line from the line joining the focal point to the vertex and the line joining the focal point to the center of the reflector aperture. Um, theta zero is the half angle subtended by the reflector at the feed. Theta one is the angle of the offset clearance height and theta two is the angle from the base to the top of the reflector. And they're both, they're all shown in this um, image. And then these are the additional design parameters. So in order to calculate the reflector directivity, we must look into the efficiency and the antenna efficiency is based off of the um, is based off of theta zero, which is the half angle subtended by the reflector at the feed. Uh, and it also takes into account N, which, um, which is defined based on the illumination taper T. Using the antenna efficiency and the reflector diameter, we can go ahead and calculate the antenna directivity, which is shown at the bottom. The half power beam width equations using the illumination taper and the reflector um, diameter is shown in the middle, um, where theta three is the half power b. And then for applications that require a specific um, scan angle, the scan factor SF takes into account the reflector diameter, diameter, the focal length, and theta star. The scan factor is the angle by which the beam is scanned for a given displacement of the feed from the focal, focal point, and the units for this are in degrees per inch. This is then used to calculate the feed displacement, which is the equation shown in the bottom um, and for the um, given scan angle. So once all of these values have been calculated, we go ahead and display, um, display the, it in the graph and, or in the table um, which has all the design data, which includes the focal length, um, the diameter, it has the values for theta star, theta zero, theta one, theta two, and then it has the efficiency that we that we just calculated. And then the program also displays the image on the right, just so the user um, better understands what um, all the data values um, represent in terms of um, the reflector geometry. And then once those main values have been calculated, we go ahead and provide um, some analysis graphs for the reflector arrays, um, reflector antenna, similar to what we did for the phased array antenna. Um, in this graph, the aperture efficiency is plotted as a function of the feed illumination taper on the reflector edge um, using the equation shown um, above with the efficiency. Um, the different curves represent the values calculated for the angle theta, um, theta zero. So for a 10 dB um, illumination taper at theta zero of um, 18.4 degrees is assumed, um, which is, or approximately 19 degrees, which is the red line. And then the yellow line is the theta zero minus 10 degrees. And then the blue line shows theta zero, um, or the blue line is theta zero minus 10 and the yellow line is theta zero plus 10 degrees. So in this graph, we can see that the optimal illumination taper is in the range of 10 to 12 dB and um, larger taper, tapers will reduce the um, illumination efficiency while the smaller tapers will reduce the spillover efficiency. So over here, we see that um, the highest efficiency is about right here, which is 10 and 12 dB. And then this is the last graph that we provided for the reflector antenna. Um, this uses the reflector diameter to calculate the directivity, um, which is displayed by the blue line, and then the half power beam width, which is shown by the red line. Um, the antenna efficiency of 81% corresponds to the um, illumination taper of 10 dB, which is assumed in the plot based on um, our required inputs. So shown, this is the reflector diameter, and then we calculated the directivity versus the 3 dB beam width um, using the equations that we displayed before, and they're also um, calculated here. Okay. 
Um, so this is um, what we plan to, um, to incorporate into the reflector um, program. So we want to plot the radiation patterns um, for the reflector, similar to how we did for the phased array antenna. And these are the equations um, for that using, um, there's the Gaussian beam for the feed horn, and then the feed illumination taper at the reflector edge um, uses these two equations. And then the bottom equation is secondary um, beam, half power beam width. So using these equations, we would um, plot the radiation patterns, and then um, we would also um, try to plot them for different tapers, um, like we did for the um, phased array, so at 5, 10, 15, and 20 dB. And then we also plan to incorporate efficiencies due to surface RMF, um, RMS errors, um, beam scan, and the antenna feed efficiency um, and then we also plan to explore multi-beam systems. For phased array antennas, we um, want to look at phased array antennas with RF front ends um, in order to better improve um, both of these programs. Thank you so much. Um, if there's any questions or anything, we can go ahead. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you, Shriya. It's a very good lecture. Uh, so there are some questions. So uh, I think uh, first of all, let me just take up, read out those questions for you. Uh, I mean, not just for you, but also for uh, the remaining two speakers, Dr. Rao, sir, and uh, Dr. Gaurangi, madam. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, read the first question from our chair. She is uh, interested to know from Miss Ria. Could you please share your experience as an internet Ravis consultant LLC? I'm sure. Yeah. So I've definitely enjoyed. Um, working um, at Rao as consultancies. Um, I've been working for over a year now. And it's definitely been a great experience. I've um, came in knowing pretty much nothing about um, the topics and I've definitely been able to learn a lot from both um, um, Garangi and um, Dr. Um, Sadaka Rao. So it's been a great experience, been able to learn a lot and been able to um, contribute um, a great amount through these programs as well. So. I've definitely enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, Harshini, anything else you want to? Nothing, sir. No, she is going to mentor uh, Sai Harshini now. Yes, not just Sai Harshini, sir. Her entire team, she formed a small team over here. Yeah, so any questions, ask uh, she, not me. Yeah. Sure, sir. Thank you. And uh, let me take up some other, uh, some more questions from outside. Uh, outside in the sense of participants from uh, outside this college. Uh, so as a student, uh, we often hear about 5G technology. How does phased array technology play a role in development and improvement of 5G networks? This question is from uh, Dhumu Malleshwar Rao. Probably I can take that question. So 5G yes. is also, so current 5G is uh, 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 current uh, 4G or uh, maybe 3G has only one element, antenna element like, uh, so it has omnidirectional radiation pattern, but uh, 5G is the one where you need more capacity, uh, more channel capacity. So you cannot do that with single element. So you need either uh, two by two array or uh, four by four or eight by eight actually uh, to increase the uh, gain. I think currently the gain is about uh, maybe close to zero dBi. So to do that, I think you need almost about 20 dB gain uh, with the new 5G systems. So that requires phase array. So I think phase array is definitely useful. Uh, how you design your uh, 5G or maybe even uh, going into uh, even bigger systems, 6G and even 100G. So the more I think capacity you need, the more the array size is going to be. And uh, so that's how I think phase array becomes useful. 
and there's some i think uh, uh, designs where uh, even reflectors people are considering especially if you go to really high frequency like g band and uh, beyond so definitely i think it will be useful it's a starting point for the design of uh, 5g systems thank you sir uh, hope maleshwar rao you got the answer and uh, the next question is from baby das pindu very nice session uh, many thanks to all the speakers a question to dr rao sir can you please discuss a bit on the feeding arrangement of the phased array antennas what kind of a phase shifters are generally used uh, the phase shifters typically it's uh, five bit or four bit phase shifters depending upon um, um, uh, how much uh, uh, losses you can tolerate so most of the systems i think we use about five uh, five bit phase shifters so that gives enough uh, uh, phase quantization to steer the beam without much errors so minimum step is going to be 360 by 32 right 2 to the power 5 so that's going to be about uh, maybe 10.5 degrees or so so half of that will be the error right so it's uh, going to be 5 5 degrees or so uh, so it depends on how much error you can tolerate and uh, uh, so typically it's uh, done through phase shifters uh this uh, digital phase shifters either uh, uh, n bit phase shifters typically and same thing for attenuators to how much you want to what is the range of the signals you want to attenuate is it uh, up to 18 db or 32 30 db etc so so that depends uh, some systems i think need if you want to really form very clear nulls for reductive antennas then you have to go even 6 bit phase shifters so the more phase, more bits you have the more complexity and more cost so you have to see most systems i would say about four bit phase shift is fine uh, most of the practical systems some i think if you don't uh, care about too much of losses uh, or phase quantization errors you can use even three bit so it depends on and uh, one more sir uh, like Uh, you were speaking something about the uh, phase shifters and their uh, ranges right uh, so what are the typical commercially available phase shifters because uh, while optimizing these antenna arrays uh, uh, especially with the phase uh, non uniform phase distribution uh, so uh, usually you, you are we are not allowed to you know, uh, we don't have that much of freedom uh, when it comes to the practical antenna arrays Uh, so uh, what do you suggest in this case no you can you can actually calculate the quantization errors and include in your analysis but if you asking about practical implementation then uh, there uh, supplies like uh, uh, many phase shifter supplies in the world so you need to discuss with them see what's the range and how much uh, uh, phase errors you get with frequency and the temperatures Uh, same thing for attenuators, right? So, Anaki Wave, I think they're supplying a lot of commercial phase shifters and attenuators. But not only that, they're supplying uh, LNAs. Uh, uh, they call it a box. It's a quad uh, quad box, which is uh, actually it uh, either uh, two by two or four by four. So it can feed about four elements or eight elements. So it's it's very compact uh, design. So it has all Eight phase shifters, eight attenuators, eight LNAs, uh, uh, tier module or switch, and then uh, you have uh, eight uh, LNAs and uh, then combining as well. So I think you need to look into the suppliers and see what exactly they can at different bands. Like commercial bands, a lot of people AMD can do AMD, uh, uh, other suppliers as well. So you can look into their specifications and. Uh, Errors and they give you the efficiency, everything, etc. So, yes, thank you. So, uh, another question from Hanuman Rao Bandari: Efficiency calculator for parabolic antennas is this uh, feature ever readily available with the tool? Yes, it's available. I think there's an equation there where efficiency is related to the taper t. So, it's it's readily available. Yes, thank you. Yes. And the reason uh, it's available only for parabolic reflect uh, parabolic distribution because that's the most efficient uh, 
uh, distribution uh, you can get for a uh, uh, for a given number of uh, uh, steps, three or four or. Focus. Yeah, can I go to the next question? Yeah. So from BVV Bhargav, a question to Dr. Rao sir. In the literature, we find antenna arrays having arrays of elements having different sizes and differently oriented. Are these techniques used in practice? Well, different elements, of course, people have used. I mean, you need to you need to have different elements depending on the bandwidth. Sometimes you have only 5% bandwidth, sometimes 10, sometimes 30%, sometimes 1000% uh, for ultra wideband uh, applications or so depending on the Bandwidth, you have to choose the elements. So either Vivaldi or Patch or Horns. So I think those guidelines is available in the software, but uh, uh, it's up to the up to the engineer or uh, uh, the designer to choose the element because there are so many elements and uh, um, so many applications. So it's uh, you cannot say that one element is better than the other element. So you have to choose based on the polarization based on the bandwidth, uh, based on the spacing, so et cetera. Is it necessary that in the antenna array that all the elements have to be similar type? Uh, yes, I think that's mainly to reduce the cost and uh, simplify. If you use different elements, the coupling effects are different. Uh, uh, you have to make two different types of uh, elements and uh, I think it's uh, and the other question is whether they have to be uh, cleaner, right? So I think the question is whether they can be oriented in a different direction, right? So, so yeah. that's possible. I think uh, th those are mostly for uh, aircraft sentinels where uh, you have a curvature of the aircraft, so you have to put them on the curvature. So for those things, I think uh, still, I think software can do, but then the element pattern uh, changes because it's oriented differently. So you have to take that into account and combine them uh, into the error factor uh, equations properly. So there are many questions, sir. Uh, shall I take up uh, two more and then we can close? I mean, uh, yeah, 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 no I, I'll copy all the questions and I'll mail it to you so that even their email IDs also. So just, Another 10 minutes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So the other question uh, from Ravidat Gupta. Thanks for the informative session. Can you please tell us if element performance also being considered in scam loss calculations of phased arrays in your tool? Yes. Scan loss depends only on the element, not on the array. So, so uh, overall array patterns have array factor multiplied by, by the element uh, element uh, pattern. So the array factor is constant. It doesn't vary. Whereas uh, the element pattern varies uh, with the uh, scan. So that's where I think uh, uh, because it broadens. So if you look at 60 degrees, I think typically your element pattern gain drops uh, around 3 dB typically. So that's that's called a scan loss. So it, it's mainly a function of the element uh, patterns. Scan loss is uh, purely function of the element pattern rollout. So you can choose some elements where uh, it can give maybe more like a flat beam type and then rolls off a bit more, uh, not that, uh, that uh, steep. So it depends on uh, how much scan loss uh, your system can allow. So uh, the other question is, uh, is the Gaussian beam analysis is an alternative to full wave analysis and uh, to what extent it can compensate it? Uh, I think it's uh, it's for a quick analysis. I think I'm not saying that it's uh, most accurate and uh, so is uh, HFSS. It's not uh, accurate as well, but uh, Gaussian beam is mainly to because you don't need the full patterns of the element you can once you choose the element you can describe that with the uh, once you calculate the 3db beam width i think that's sufficient so based on that you can express the main beam as a, a function uh, as a 
Gaussian beam roll off and then up to the side lobes. So it gives pretty accurate results. I think we compared with the measured results on three different arrays and reflector systems as well. I think they're mostly within a quarter dB. So, so that's very good for initial design. And uh, I think once you design, I think this could be done in about five minutes or 10 minutes given the requirements. So then you can sort of design the system around it. And then if they want the detailed analysis, most of the proposals don't need detailed analysis. So just you have to give them what is the, uh, <coughs> what is the design, array size and uh, how many elements, et cetera, and the board diagram and some losses and some performance. So this is good enough. And then once you sort of uh, do a detailed design, then use this and then you run a full wave analysis. Uh, and even then it's not accurate, but now nowadays we are doing finite array effects. So we take into account finite array. Uh, so that takes very long time. So typically the design won't close till maybe takes about two months or maybe more or some cases, uh, depending on the complexity of the array. Uh, so the other question is to characterize the phase arrays, phase array for a prime uh, focus for parabolic dish, all beams to be with the same edge tapper or spillover. No, uh, uh, can you read the question again? I think it's mixed to, up. <laughs> the, to characterize the phased array for a prime focus parabolic dish, all beams to be with the same edge tapper or spillover. No, typically it's both the two different, right? I think uh, typically the reflector has only one feed. Uh, most cases, of course, there is phase, uh, array, arrays of feeds uh, for multi-beam applications. But uh, for, a, for a given uh, beam, I think you have only single feed. So I think uh, that single feed will be looking at the uh, center of the reflector and uh, that gives the uh, whatever the taper you design, 12 dB or 10 dB, and that's it. Sir, uh, we'll take few more questions, sir. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So a uh, question from Varsha. Uh, thank you for the good information, informative session. Can you please tell me, sir, phased array antenna, is it used for energy harvesting application? So she is expert in energy harvesting, so she can yes. answer. Answer is yes, oh. but uh, Shreya? Oh, I'm not too sure. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can do that, but it depends on the application. I think mostly it's uh, done with uh, small um, phase arrays, uh, uh, energy harvesting, but depends on what exactly is the application you're using energy harvesting. Is it? Uh, uh, so it depends. How, how the elements are used on solar arrays and if it is uh, uh, energy harvesting through solar energy, then it's a different design. If it is energy harvesting for something else, it's a, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a, uh, I think arrays are typically used, but uh, it depends on the application. Yes. So there are a few more questions from uh, students, I believe, uh, and especially these are from uh, what the, being taught by, uh, I mean, dealt by our Go Dr. Gaurangi, madam. So the question is uh, effective aperture and electrical length of the antenna. Uh, so are these two different? Uh, Gaurangi, are you there? Otherwise, I can I can sort of uh, aperture is for. Uh, uh, for a given two-dimensional uh, 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 feed, uh, like a horn antenna or something else, or uh, a patch antenna, whereas the length is mainly for dipoles or monopoles, etc. So it's a linear type of element. Uh, so he's asking, uh, is there any specific relation between the effective aperture? Because uh, in the first, uh, uh, during the first few slides, uh, she was actually discussing about the effective aperture of these. Yeah. Things. Effective yeah. aperture is uh, uh, basically you can call it electrical aperture. Oh. So other is a physical aperture. 
So effective aperture changes with efficiency. So if you have 100% efficiency, your electrical aperture is equivalent to physical aperture. But sometimes I think some feed elements you have less than 100%. So that means typically your electrical aperture is smaller than the physical aperture. But then, then there is a, a particular type of elements where your electrical aperture is more than physical aperture. So yeah, so it depends on type of element. So, so it basically uh, effect, effective aperture basically tells you uh, how much is the how efficiently you're using the physical aperture. Sir, one more sir. Uh, there are actually a uh, good number of questions, but I I'm just picking up few so that uh, because it is already ten thirty and it's it's been almost more than two and a half hours, three hours, sir. So uh, one more question, sir. Uh, what is the worst case directivity or worst case gain and how do we uh, calculate them or uh, uh, figure out before we start the design? I mean, uh, this is related to the, uh, the tool only. List. Related to phase array or reflector? Phase array. Uh, phase, oh, phase array, yeah, that's a good question because uh, Typically, you have a coverage or scan region, say 20 degrees or 30 degrees, or for geostationary satellites, about 10 degrees, 9 degrees or so. So that is given. And then uh, your uh, minimum gain over the coverage is given. So you want to have the minimum gain. So, and then that means you have to account for the scan loss, not just the both side gain, both side directivity, but you have to calculate the scan loss. Uh, uh, at the edge of the scan region, and that is directivity. Then you have to account for the losses. So, what are the uh, back end losses, etc.? You can calculate. Sometimes you need filters, sometimes uh, uh, ohmic losses, uh, some dielectric losses, some connector losses. So, all these things, whatever is uh, going up to the front end, like amplifiers, uh, uh, SSP output up to that point, or LNA input point have to calculate all those losses because they affect, uh, uh, they impact the system. So you have to subtract those losses. And then uh, say, for example, if uh, directivity uh, gain you need is 20 dB <coughs> for the coverage and your scan loss is 1 dB and your front end loss are 1 dB. So you have to design the bore side beam with the 22 dB directivity, right? So yeah. those things you need to account for the losses, include that, and then uh, uh, 2dB means about 60% more, 66% uh, uh, more uh, number of elements you need, rather than what you calculate the directivity. So typical specs are in the game. So nobody cares about, at least uh, hardware engineers, they don't care about directivity. It's only a, a fictitious number. We, we care about the game. So what gain you can uh, get over a uh, uh, scan region. Right? So uh, that, that's up to the user. Uh, yes. How to include those and uh, design the array. So hope the question is uh, answered. Uh, so sir, one last question. Uh, what are the uh, different types of array geometries? That are considered that can be uh, dealt using this tool other than this rectangle and hexagonal. Well, I mean, you can you can uh, uh, you can put. Uh, I mean, typically that that's what we have uh, either square, rectangular, circular, or hexagonal because they are the most uh, practical shapes of the arrays you have. Because I don't see any other shape. Maybe elliptical shape could be part of the circular aperture because you can give the ellipticity and then you can uh, design. So that's one uh, one case of the circular aperture. But other than that, I don't see any regular aperture suitable for uh, uh, most of the applications. So I, I don't know what exactly you mean, but uh, yeah. I mean, it doesn't cover all of them, but uh, most, most cases can be covered by these aperture shapes. Yes, sir. 
so I have copied uh, the remaining questions, sir, uh, so that I can, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'll make a document and I'll send it to you.